the website, uh, the Net for Society YouTube channel, as well as on the Gender Action website. Furthermore, we invite you all to complete a short feedback form after the webinar to help us to further improve our services and give you tailor-made information and support. We will put the link later on in the, feed, in the chat box on your right side and also send it to you after this webinar. Together with this feedback form, we will provide you with an additional information document with a useful background reading and references to relevant sources. During the webinar, we kindly ask you to mute your microphones to optimize the overall audio quality during the session. We nevertheless encourage you to type your questions. You may have to the speakers and to the chat function on the right side of the screen during the session. After the session, we will then address the questions to the speakers. And as I already mentioned before, we are not only happy to welcome you, but also to have two excellent speakers with us today. Our first speaker, Ms. Katrin van der Heiden from Yellow Window Management Consultants, will give us insights in the overall framework of sex and gender and the research cycle, as well as an introduction to the relevance for and in projects addressing Societal Challenge 6. Afterwards, we are eager to hear about specific information on gender relevance in and for research proje projects in Societal Challenge 6, which will be given to us by Maxime Forest from, from Science Po Paris, who you see here on the right side. So with no further delay, I'm uh, handing over to Katrin for our first session. Okay, I hope everybody can hear me now. Uh, so thank you, Dominique, for that excellent introduction. Uh, I will take over now uh, with giving you an introduction into gender uh, and research, and then Maxime will go deeper into the topics uh, of today. First, we start, of course, with the basic concepts. Uh, and then I want to point out, because this is often uh, uh, something that people miss, is that sex and gender are not the same concepts. Oftentimes, people think that gender is a modern word for sex, uh, but uh, however, scientifically speaking, they're two completely distinct concepts. Sex comes from the biological science, and it really refers to the biologically determined characteristics of men and women in terms of the reproductive organs and functions based on chromosomal complement and physiology. Uh, simply put, this just means that sex is really just a biological thing, to differentiate between masculinity and femininity. And it's three ways to determine the sex of a person. It's the chromosomes. And as you know, there is uh, some persons, persons are born with XX and others with XY. Then there are the hormones. As you know, men produce more testosterone and women more estrogen hormones. And then there is, of course, the anatomy with penis and breasts and uterus, etc. And all of that is sex. As such, sex is globally understood as a classification of the living things, as male and female, and it's quite uh, did, uh, st static, meaning that, um, as we all know, biology uh, is subject to very slow change, as described by the theory of Darwin, the evolution theory, which means that a woman in the Middle Ages would be exactly the same, uh, physically speaking, as I am now today, uh, as a woman. These things change very slowly on a biological scale. Gender, however, is a totally different concept coming from a totally different scientific field. Gender comes from the social, social sciences um, and it refers to the social construction. So not the biological, but the social construction of women and men, of femininity and masculinity. And this varies in time and place and between cultures. As such, gender is a much more flexible concept than sex uh, because gender is something that we as a culture create and we can recreate it and change it just in one generation time if you want to. And that doesn't happen so fast with regards to sex. Now, how do we create this? And that you, as you can see, I'm moving towards a, a dialogue that has been going on between sociologists and biologists for the past hundreds of years between nature and nurture. So are these stereotypical, these gender stereotypes as we call them, 
are the natural or constructed competences. And as you see in the pictures, just walk into a toy store, and then you can easily see that girls are uh, really um, much tempted and, and stimulated by our culture. We give them toys with human figures, with soft colors. Uh, you see she's holding one princess, one prince, and there are several princesses in the castle. So what she will develop as competences is obviously language skills, but maybe also a lot of relationship skills in these complex situations, as you can see there. Um, and she's going to develop empathy, et cetera, et cetera, a lot of care competences, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas the boy on the right side of the picture, he will not so much be stimulated to develop his linguistics or communication skills, but much more his technical skills. He will be wanting to take the machine apart and put it back together. So we shouldn't be surprised that by the age of 18, the girl on the left will enroll to study psychology and the boy on the right to do engineering. And this is exactly what we find if you look at the statistics in Europe of what of you know the gendered choices that people make when they enroll at university or high school. So people often like to think that this is really a biological difference. Um, but as sociologists, we say no, there is a lot of gender, a big gendered layer there as well, a culture that stimulates boys and girls to develop into these areas without there being a biological uh, predisposition to do these things. Now, you might think this is not a problem because we do need psychologists in society and we need engineers. So why is it a problem that we stimulate half of the population to do one and the other half to do both? Well, the problem relies on the fact that some of the girls on the left side might not at all have a natural tendency to be linguistically competent or to become psychologists. They might have competences naturally talents which are much more into the scientific engineering field and vice versa the boy on the right might actually have a talent to be much more of a psychologist than an engineer so what we see in europe is that we waste people's talents people cannot develop their full potential because they are restricted by the gender stereotypes and what is expected of their gender to develop and this might not be their natural talent because it's not like that that more boys are born with the talent to become an engineer. They are just so much um, by, by our society, they are stimulated to develop these competences. So the first problem is that people do not attain their full uh, uh, competences and talents. Then a second problem attached to this uh, biological determination and pushing boys and girls towards gender stereotypes is what you see with the picture in the middle, where girls are still much more um, associated with taking care of the household, taking care of the children, vacuum cleaning and doing household chores, etc., etc. And this is exactly also what we find in the statistics, that women drop out of their professional careers once they have their second or third child. That's when they decide to either work part-time or not work at all anymore. Also, when they return from long-time unemployment uh, due to having had children and staying at home for a couple of years, uh, they have a, very, a much harder time to find jobs and to reconnect with their professional careers. So what we see is that women pay a huge economic price uh, for you know, doing what is stereotypically thought and pushed on their shoulders to do. They pay a huge economic price with regards to their professional careers. And this is really quite problematic. Just as much we can say that boys pay a price as well, because when we talk about gender, it's not just talking about women and girls, it's also talking about boys and men. Just as much as women feel the burden of the stereotypical expectations according to their sex, the sex that they're born with, just as much boys feel this burden. So the pressure on boys will be much more to precisely develop a very successful professional career and sometimes to the expense of the time, uh, to the, to the, uh, they, they pay a price by not being able to spend so much time um, in their relationship with their children, in the household, etc., etc., because they're not expected to do these things. And so they might feel emotionally much more isolated, or they might feel a very heavy burden to have an extremely successful career. So boys are as much as girls pushed into stereotypical thinking. Now, the problem is not so much the difference between men and women as such, so I would not want to have a plea here today to say that women should become men 
or men should become women. That's not at all what we want. We don't want them to become a unisex type of uh, person that is exactly the same. Because as such, difference uh, is a good thing in society. Diversity is a good thing. Uh, diversity leads to um, innov innovation and creativity. Diversity is a very good thing for so society. It's just that um, when the differences between men and women are valued differently, then we get inequality. And that's still the case in our societies, because certain aspects associated with masculinity still tend to be valued more highly. Uh, just imagine a man with a professional career is valued more highly than a woman who is a very, uh, um, a very successful housewife. Um, now, this, the result of all this is inequality of opportunity, segregation and discrimination. And that's not okay. When differences lead to inequality, that's not okay. And we should uh, fight against these things. Just as an illustration, in the lower right corner of the slide, you see this picture, uh, which is a representation of the wage gap, for example. On average, women still earn about 80% of a man's salary throughout Europe. So this is one of the things where it becomes problematic, where it's not just a difference between men and women, but a problem, an inequality. Now, the European Commission has made an excellent definition of what gender equality would be if we would have gender equal societies. And that would be a situation where individuals of both sexes are free to develop their personal abilities and make choices without the limitations imposed by strict gender roles. So the possibly different behaviors, aspirations and needs of women and men should be considered, valued and favored equally. People, girls, boys, men and women should be able to develop their full potential, whatever that is, and, and, and step away from the gendered expectations. Now, let's turn to Horizon 2020, now that we've had this short introduction into the basic concept and see what does this mean now if people are applying for a project within Horizon 2020. The European Commission has three objectives that underpin the European Commission strategy on gender equality in research and innovation policy. The first one is to foster equality in scientific careers. And I already touched upon that subject in the introduction of the concepts, saying that women we see drop out much more in professional careers than men. And this is exactly and more specifically true in academic careers. We see, see a huge dropout rate of women. So we want them to, to build equal uh, equality in their scientific careers. A second objective is ensuring a gender balance in decision-making processes and bodies. We want to make sure that the voices of women in academic careers are heard because it's specifically the voices of women which are not heard because they don't uh, get equal uh, chances to build their careers. And a third objective is integrating the gender dimension in research and innovation context. This means taking into account the biological characteristics and the social features of men and women. So taking into account the both variable sex and gender into the topic of your research. Now, if we look, this is just a, a summary, if we look at gender in research, that's the right side uh, bubble, we see that there are actually two main ingredients to attain that. The first one, is to ensure that we have equal opportunities in research at all the levels of the research career. And the second ingredient is integration of gender and sex variable in the research contents. And I will uh, now turn towards the first bubble, which is this one, the one in green now. And then my colleague Maxim will then give an explanation on the second bubble. Now, to look at the first feature, um, I show you a graph here uh, that was produced in chief figures in the publication of 2015, the famous scissor diagram, because the, it looks a little bit like a scissor. The blue line are the men and the yellow line uh, or the orange line are the women. And what we see here uh, at, uh, at uh, the horizontal axis are all the stages of an academic career. And we can clearly see that more women than men enroll at university level and they get even bigger scores. More women than men get a degree at university level. So that's, we're off to a very good start with regards to 
participation of women. And we've seen this for the past 20 or 30 years for most scientific fields, except the, um, the still masculine dominated scientific fields, which I will turn to shortly. But then, as you can see, women start to drop out. And we end when we look at the grade A, which is the highest grade of professorship at universities in Europe, we see that we are left with only about 21% women and 82% men, which is very problematic uh, that, uh, um, that it's so much dominated by men. So we have a huge gap there that we should close down. In only eight out of the 28 EU member states did women account for more than 40% of researchers. So this is really very problematic. And we call this phenomenon a leaky pipeline. It's not so much a glass ceiling. Glass ceiling is the phenomenon that most people have heard of, but this is more of a leaky pipeline. It means that there is not just one stage where women cannot go to, because we do have 20% of women at the highest career level. It's more that at each progressive step of the career ladder, we see that more women than men drop out, and this is problematic. Now, this graph is exactly the same, but here we, we narrow it down uh, to only the STEM careers, which means engineering students, uh, uh, th those, those types of, uh, of uh, scientific fields. And what we see here is that the situation is even worse. The graph, the line of the men and the women don't even touch, uh, and we are left with only 13% women at the highest level of the career and 89% men. So here in these types of career, we still need to stimulate girls to make these career choices in the first place at university level uh, to study. Of course, all of this is also more stimulated by the gender stereotypes of society. And in the lower left corner, you see a picture there of Rupert Sheldon, which is the main character in a television series, Big Ben, which is very popular. And these types of things reinforce that men are associated with these types of sciences uh, and, and even with being nerds in these types of sciences. And obviously, um, <clears throat> these types of stereotypes, when they are reinforced, this also will be a threshold for girls to make these career choices. So we really have a, 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 a responsibility as societies to break these stereotypes down. Now, uh, what we also see nowadays is that um, as, as being a gender expert, and I've been doing gender trainings for the past 20 years, I really noticed that most people absolutely agree that men and women are equal, that they should get equal opportunities, and they've been agreeing this for you know the past 20, 30 years. So I've we were starting to wonder as gender experts, why is it that it, if everybody is convinced, convinced that women and men are equal, that we should treat them equally, give them equal chances, we don't see this happening in society. And then we discovered over the past few years that we started to study the unconscious biases that people have in our heads, which are stereotypes that we're not even aware of. And we started to realize that they really influence people's judgments very heavily and they influence our behavior and we should become more aware of them. And this uh, slide is just one small example of how these unconscious biases work. When I talk to an audience and I ask them, give me some names of role models in ICT, then all of them say Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, Elon Musk, because these are nowadays role models. They're all masculine. And this relates to the fact that women do not make career choices anymore in ICT. Women don't study ICT, they don't have careers in ICT. And this is in high contrast to the fact that in actually originally ICT was a female dominated field. And I give you here three pictures to reverse this picture. The first one on the left upper corner is a picture of Ada Lovelace. She was a British mathematician living in the 19th century, and she laid the foundation for software programming. So all software programs used today, they use the mathematical principles laid down by Ada Lovelace. On the right side, you see a picture of Margaret Hamilton. She wrote the entire software package that sent the Apollo rockets of the NASA uh, to the moon. Uh, so, and you see her standing there with the entire software program that she has written. The pile is almost higher than she is herself. 
And she wrote that software program, as you can see in the picture, at a very young age. Then in the lower left uh, 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 corner is a picture of a group of women working in a room. And actually, the job description that they had was called a computer. And this was long before the invention of computer. It was actually a job, mostly done by women. And it meant people who do calculations by hand. So as you can see, we've had a stereotypical uh, the stereotype about what ICT is has really switched in the world from being a female dominated field towards being a male dominated field. And this is now something, the fact that we see all these male dominated role models will reinforce our unconscious biases about what, uh, uh, what ICT should be. And now we all think it's a male dominated field and we associate it with masculinity and masculine competences and it shouldn't be like that because it used to be female dominated so it's really us who can change and challenge these types of stereotypes now what the european commission wants everybody to do is to build to build gender equality plans at uh, universities and in academia to break down exactly these stereotypes and to ensure that women can build equal careers now, what, what does it mean to build a gender equality plan? Well, it starts by doing an impact assessment or an audit of where are you now with regards to the procedures and practices and to identify the gender biases that still exist, for example, in your recruitment procedures. How, why is it that women don't get equal opportunities? How do you recruit? What are all the steps? what happens that women are not identified as, as, as candidates, etc., etc. So after you conducted an assessment of where all the biases are still in your system, in your uh, ac academic um, functioning and procedures, then you have to identify and implement innovative strategies to correct those biases. And then you have to set targets and monitoring to progress, uh, the, 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 to, to monitor the progression via indicators. You have to set indicators to measure are we making any progress to close all those gaps. Now there is a very nice tool that was uh, developed. It's called the GEAR tool and you see a picture of the GEAR tool on the right side of the slide. That's a publication from EIGE and EIGE is the European Institute for Gender Equality. So if you Google the title there, which has gender equality in academia and research, if you Google that, you very easily find the GEAR tool. And you also see the link there below. The GEAR tool is actually an online tool that can assist you as an academic research institution to develop your own gender equality plan. The GEAR tool actually talks about five areas of intervention. The first is the organizational culture that you should work on, for example, by organizing gender training. And it's also very important, as you are NCPs, that you communicate to any consortia who wants to write up a proposal that they can include gender training in the budget of the proposal, because it's eligible for refund by the European Commission. So you can organize gender training to break down those stereotypes. A second area of intervention is a reconciliation of work and private life. Just to name one of the concrete measures that you can do is parents to parents coaching to help people to deal with becoming a parent and having an academic career. Third area of intervention is recruitment selection and career progression. One of the steps that you could take as an example is anonymize certain steps to avoid unconscious bias. Um, fourth area of intervention is leadership and decision making. For example, some universities eventually decided to install quota for women in all decision making commissions and other bodies to ensure that the women's voices are heard. Then a fifth area of intervention is uh, sexual and gender based harassment. Uh, for example, you can install special points, points of, 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 of contact persons for sexual harassment in your things. Now, if you look at the gear tool online, you will see that in all of these areas of intervention, they have many more good practice examples of universities and of steps that you can take, actions that you can take, and it's linked to real universities who have actually taken those steps and who did these things. 
So it's absolutely worth worthwhile uh, to um, to show anybody the Deer tool uh, to try to work with this tool. Um, and then we get to the second stage, um, the second big ingredient of gender in research, which is how to use gender and sex as variables in the research content. Um, and I will now switch uh, to my colleague Maxine um, to um, uh, get um, um, uh, so that he can uh, start the presentation and I will mute my microphone. Good morning, um, everybody. I'm happy to take home uh, this presentation and uh, thanks to Katrin for both laying the ground of the discussion and, uh, and uh, sharing with us insights about this uh, first component, uh, which is out ensuring gender equality and, uh, um, and uh, uh, participation of women in research project. Um, so now I would like to uh, address indeed this second bubble she was mentioning uh, earlier on. Uh, which is about gender in uh, the content of uh, of research, uh, and to do so, uh, I'll suggest to be very uh, practical and to go through the different uh, themes of uh, the current work program for 2018-2020, uh, with this idea that um, if we uh, really want to uh, to address um, Europe in a changing world. Uh, we can hardly be inclusive, innovative, or uh, uh, build reflective societies without uh, uh, bringing a gender perspective. So, um, we're going to start with, uh, uh, in the order uh, of the, the different calls on migration, uh, the socio-economic and cultural transformations in the context of the fourth uh, industrial revolution, and governance for the future, and uh, see how the gender perspective can actually uh, support better research. So if we first go um, with migration and checking the relevance of both sex and gender as variables uh, to this topic, uh, then we have an excellent uh, starting point because actually um, uh, gender uh, in particular, but also sex uh, to some respect, um, greatly matter if we have to address the topic of migration in all its dimensions. Um, and there are many reasons to that. One of these reasons is uh, the recent evolution of the phenomenon of migration itself. For decades uh, in the 20th century, um, migrants have, be, have been predominantly uh, male. Uh, people um, uh, leaving their countries to seek new uh, uh, economic and social opportunities uh, were usually men uh, who later reunite their uh, families when possible uh, in their countries of uh, arrival, of destination. Uh, the same for people uh, trying to escape political or religious persecution um, due to uh, um, the distribution of social roles in societies. Uh, people who are most at risk of suffering um, uh, this type of persecutions were usually men and therefore um, people uh, applying for the status of refugees in different countries were mostly men. This is no longer the case. And that's one of the biggest change uh, that uh, uh, affected the phenomenon of migration over the past decades. Currently, uh, it is estimated that uh, about the half of all migrants worldwide are women. Uh, some type of migrants, uh, like uh, people uh, moving for uh, uh, undertaking uh, care work or domestic work, are predominantly women. Um, and this has changed consider considerably the face of migration. Um, another uh, example is that people leaving for, uh, to escape uh, political or religious or other type of persecution are also increasingly uh, uh, women. Uh, in a country uh, like France, for instance, which I know best because I'm also dealing with uh, uh, these issues in the French context, um, um, about 33% uh, of all um, applicants to international protection are women. And this can rise, depending on the years, up to 40%. And over 36% of all people 
granted uh, asylum uh, in France are actually women. So this is a considerable change, uh, quite a recent one, uh, that has changed the face of uh, uh, migrations uh, worldwide. And therefore, there is a need uh, to take this into, into account. Uh, there, is, there are all, many other reasons to do so uh, yet. Uh, one of those reasons is that actually female migrants face different and to uh, a, a, like major risk uh, including the risk of sexual exploitation, trafficking, or gender-based violence uh, all along the, um, uh, the course of their uh, migratory trajectories. Um, if we take the example of people uh, leaving their countries due uh, to uh, uh, political unrest, civil wars, or international conflicts, uh, we know that the migrant migration routes to Europe uh, in particular um, of plague of danger that particularly affect women or girls, um, that there are certain, um, uh, even certain reasons for leaving their countries which are gender related, uh, uh, like uh, if we take the example of the Syrian conflict, uh, there is a huge gender dimension in this conflict using uh, 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 rape as um, uh, a tool uh, of, the, of the civil war. Um, and this, of course, uh, uh, brings uh, greater risk to, on women, and these risks are maintained all over their uh, migration route to Europe, as they may, expo may be exposed to human trafficking, but by uh, smugglers uh, taking them to Europe, uh, and, and they can even be exposed when they get on the European soil, uh, because they are at a greater exposure also of being involved in uh, prostitution systems uh, or being uh, uh, sexually bribed in, in order to, uh, uh, to, uh, to get protection when they are uh, in Europe. So there are uh, definitely significant risks affecting uh, 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 women. Um, and once they are uh, in uh, Europe, uh, uh, and even if they are granted uh, protection or a legal status, if they are economic migrants, then women will suffer double discrimination, both as migrants uh, recently arrived on a territory and as women. And uh, uh, this is also of particular uh, uh, relevance. Uh, they might also experience uh, different uh, um, access to, uh, to the health system, uh, one had destination, uh, and uh, face uh, particular health problems also due uh, uh, sometimes to the traumatism, to the traumas they have lived. Uh, on the route uh, to uh, to Europe. Uh, but gender is also relevant uh, once at destination. If we now look to the integration side uh, of the migration phen uh, phenomenon, uh, because there are indeed gender differences uh, uh, in, that might affect this population in terms of access to education, uh, to labor, to so, uh, social and health services, or uh, to uh, uh, housing, for instance. Uh, migrant women will meet specific challenges with regard to their full integration, and they might also play a specific role in the broader integration process of their families and uh, relatives, uh, for which it is necessary to take this variable into account. Uh, for instance, imported gender norms can limit women's ability to orient themselves in their new environment uh, because of the lack of access to education and social relationships, uh, to uh, sometimes a more limited access to the public space than uh, men enjoy, uh, which can lead eventually to lack of confidence and to isolation, which altogether will definitely undermine their capacity to integrate. There are also different expectations uh, linked to gender norms that can affect both girls' and boys' perspectives with regard to accessing higher education, which in turn will create different conditions for their respective prospect uh, in accessing the labor market, uh, leading, for instance, to horizontal segregation, uh, uh, men and women uh, uh, for, with a background, migrant background being uh, limited to certain type of jobs, which will be different for men and women, uh, or eventually to higher unemployment rates for men in some 
EU countries, like men having a migrant background, uh, being like more, even more discriminated on the labor market than women would be, or women being discriminated in a different way. Uh, uh, this can also uh, uh, apply to, uh, for instance, to uh, access to uh, social housing or housing in general. There were some uh, 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 surveys uh, being carried out, some studies carried out in several uh, EU countries, including in Belgium, showing that actually single uh, uh, women with or without children uh, with a ma migrant uh, background uh, will be slightly less discriminated than men. Uh, a single man uh, in accessing uh, housing. Um, and these norms, like gender norms, and how they are perpetrated by the community uh, in the country of destination, in the country of residence, uh, uh, can also undermine access to uh, sexual and reproductive health. Uh, we can take also the example of uh, female genital mutilation, uh, which in some EU countries are occasionally perpetrated in the country of destination or in a country like France uh, on the occasion of uh, a trip uh, uh, organized to the country uh, of origin. So all these parameters should be definitely taken into account to address the multidimensional dimension of, uh, of migration. And it is also necessary to look at the role of gender equality as a value uh, for uh, successful uh, uh, integration, both from the perspective of migrants, how they can suc successfully cope with gender norms that potentially conflagrate with those inherited from their context of origins, and from the perspective of the country of residence, where gender equality can be used either as a powerful tool of integration or as another effective instrument to discriminate, uh, to discriminate uh, notably men, because colonial past also has its gender uh, component. Then if we uh, take other examples, uh, this time from uh, the course on uh, addressing the social, economic and cultural transformations uh, in the context of the fourth industrial revolution, and how it affects Europe. So this fourth industrial revolution uh, basically is about uh, uh, digitalization, uh, robotization, uh, the use of uh, big data and how it will shape our societies, uh, the role also and the use of uh, artificial um, uh, intelligence. And also from uh, uh, this perspective, gender matter. If we look first to the cultural dimension of this fourth industrial uh, revolution. Uh, there are a number of aspects that can be addressed from a gender perspective. For instance, uh, although new social media are taking over most of our relationships and communication, existing gender stereotypes and bias are automatically reproduced into these new forms of communication. And therefore, norms and values are replicated without any emancipation or change taking place. Instead, uh, we see that existing phenomena such as gender-based violence and harassment are taking new forms online, which are increasingly addressed uh, by public authorities. And this is, for instance, one of the priorities of the uh, uh, Austrian presidency of the uh, European Council. Uh, and it has been also recently addressed by a public uh, state report uh, in France. The processes of digitalization and robotization also affect human interactions at work, within the family, or in our intimate life. And the cultural impact of this change is still largely unknown and should be approached from a gender perspective, because these three contexts of human interactions have all a strong gender dimension. For instance, care work is mostly undertaken by women. Uh, in many European countries, actually uh, over 80 or 90 percent of all caregivers are women. Men and women do not only still exert different social roles uh, with respect to care or education, but they have also uh, often different emotional reactions due to gender education and socialization. So gender is an important dimension also to take into account uh, in cultural transformation so that we ensure that harmful stereotypes are not uh, reproduced, but will be challenged by this revolution. And now, if we uh, check to the um, 
um, um, socioeconomic changes, uh, which are fundamental, uh, which are brought by digitalization, robotization, um, they will be also better tackled using gender lenses. For instance, again, um, paid and unpaid uh, care work is predomin predominantly undertaken by women. And jointly, digital services, artificial intelligence and robotization are expected to drastically change how care work is delivered. And here gender matters from all perspectives. How care will be delivered to womb and by womb. New technologies can either help to positively transform gender imbalances with respect to care work or negatively impact what has remained a predominantly female area of work by eliminating a low paid job opportunities without providing new opportunities for self-empowerment or emancipation. And sex, of course, can also be relevant when it comes to its influences uh, on bodily capacities uh, or the epidemiologics of certain disease, notably with regard to uh, uh, those diseases leading to dependence. Similarly, if we uh, look now at algorithms and artificial intelligence, which are meant to transform how public and private services are to be designed and delivered in our societies, uh, we can um, see that uh, collecting data and using it for that purpose is not a gender neutral operation. Historically, data have been usually collected and interpreted in a gender biased way and did not reflect men's and women's realities uh, to a same extent. Even algorithms may be subject to gender bias. Why? Because they are also instruments uh, originally set up by humans. Artificial uh, intelligence builds upon the self-learning self capacity of machines, but it also largely relies upon human matching interactions, leading machines to reproduce gender biases or stereotypes as consequence of this learning process. And this is actually why, what Kate Crawford called the artificial intelligence white guide problem. And she said that uh, sexism, racism, other form of discrimination are actually being built into the machine learning algorithm that underlies the technology behind many intelligent systems that shape how we are or will be categorized and advertised too. And she takes many examples and for instance, uh, uh, users who recently discovered that Google's photo app, uh, which applies automatic labels to pictures in digital photo albums, was classifying image of black people as gorillas. And this is one of the many examples she quote, and of course, this also affect uh, gender uh, stereotype. So in relation to a transformation uh, in the context of the fourth industrial revolution, there are also uh, many uh, gender components uh, at stake. So let's move now to the last of this, uh, of this uh, uh, core topic, to, to the call, which is um, uh, actually uh, uh, the topic of governance for the future. Um, one aspect to first take into account is that governance itself, at the very subject, uh, has been plagued for uh, uh, like all along the history by, con by considerable uh, gender imbalances. And what you see here on the screen are just a few general indicators of the existing gender gaps in governance and decision making taken from the European Institute for Gender Equality uh, website. And those only reflect uh, the fact that governing societies remain affected by strong uh, gender imbalances. Hence, rethinking governance for the future, notably by taking on board uh, the potentialities of digitalization, should tackle these imbalances and reflect upon the gender implications of any of forcing uh, innovation. Uh, for instance, when we address uh, the topic of trust in governance or the rise of populism, two vital issues for the future of democracy in Europe, then gender differences should be definitely taken into account. For instance, because there is a higher level of trust of women in public democratic institutions, but also a greater sensi sensitivity of women to corruption, bad governance, or the impact on the delivery of uh, public goods. 
but we should also uh, uh, take into account the fact that uh, some gender differences, some gender gaps are progressively uh, breached and not necessarily for the good. For instance, the capacity of populistic or xenophobic movement to actually uh, 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 reach uh, governmental position is Europe is largely conditioned by the fact that uh, the lower support of women uh, to this, uh, uh, to this uh, type of parties, which has historically been the case, is no longer so clear. And more generally, uh, uh, there is a, um, um, gender issues are core to the discourses of populist and extremist parties all across the US, uh, the, the European Union. Populism and extreme ideologies, which are on the rise in Europe, are also known to have a strong gender complement. Sexual rights are the core to many political struggles undertaken by populist movement in Europe. And the theoricians of so-called illiberal democracies, as Viktor Orban, that you see on your screen, openly embrace ultra-conservative views on gender issues, which make it relevant to understand what is actually going on uh, uh, from this perspective. So understanding such trends requires to pay attention to this dimension. And if we also mention radicalization, which is also increasingly addressed uh, from a gender perspective, uh, it is not only because it concerns individuals of both sexes, uh, but also because in the case of Islamis, Islamic radical, radicalism, for instance, it conveys fundamentally unequal rules for men and women and adopts often gender specific channels to reach its target, to actually involve people in this radicalization uh, process. And the last example could be uh, that if we are reflecting upon new forms of delivering public goods and inclusive services, um, uh, uh, using all the potentialities of big data and digitalization, uh, for instance, then we should address the respective necessities of men and women and possibly different ways to reach them out uh, 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 into this process. And that definitely uh, has not been the case so far. For instance, civic techs, we, we pretend to, uh, feel, uh, to change the way uh, people, citizens are involved in uh, co-designing public policies and public services. Well, these civic techs remain uh, uh, in, in large proportion uh, uh, a male area which uh, could lead to reproduce existing gender segregation, discrimination or bias in uh, this governance for the future. So we see that going through all these topics, uh, everywhere gender matters. And actually, when going through the call, I did not find found a single one that would be completely gender neutral. And most of them were actually evilly uh, 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 charge in terms of gender content. So this is a way to improve uh, the quality of research, quality of proposal, and uh, uh, definitely not in a marginal uh, way. And remember also that addressing gender, as Catherine said, is not only about addressing women. Uh, it's actually addressing the very gender um, dimension, which has implications for both women and men in our societies and uh, having uh, a better uh, perspective on, uh, on these uh, topics. So this could reflect uh, while designing your proposal in how uh, you uh, fuel with content your different wear packages. Uh, what you see on your screen now are just a few examples, but actually this can take different form. But the best way to include this gender perspective is actually to put your gender lens from the beginning uh, to the end of the proposal drafting uh, in order uh, to uh, fully reflect it in the different component from the understanding of the uh, call and of uh, the very uh, relevance of your project uh, to the way it will be implemented. And I think that now we can uh, leave the, uh, like um, uh, about 10 minutes uh, for, for uh, the questions and answer. And thank you for uh, your attention. Thank you very much, Maxime, and also thank you to Katrin for your very insightful um, speeches and slides. You, our participants, have now the chance to type questions into the checkbox. If you 
didn't do so yet. We only received one comment yet, which uh, is addressed to Katrin's uh, speech, which says that sex may surely also refer to the biological determined characteristics of other categories than men and women. This is, as we know, much less dichotomous than conventionally presumed. Katrin, would you like to say something to this comment? Yes, thank you very much. I agree. Uh, it's just that in a very short webinar of one hour, I don't want to go too deep into that, but it's obviously true that both the concepts of sex and gender are not just two completely differentiated categories between men and, and women. So, for example, on a sexual field, on, on, in the field of sex, uh, we see that some babies are born with XXY chromosomes. So they're really intersex persons. There's lots of medical conditions like that. So there is a big gray area between men and women, between masculinity and femininity. And obviously this is also true with regards to gender. Some people do not feel that the, the, the sex they're born with is, the, is, is also the gender that they feel they have. And uh, some people have a very androgynous uh, gender identity. So I completely agree that it's not a dichotomy where there is really black and white and nothing in between. Okay, thank you very much, Katrin. Uh, I'm not seeing any further questions so far, but I'm sure they might come the one or the other. Um, we have another comment on the um, content of this webinar. Someone just says that she was expecting uh, the practical advice on how to deal with gender in a proposal. For this, you may contact your national contact point directly or the our experts from that gender action because as well as the um as Katrin's uh, explanations uh, it's very hard to cover this in an one hour webinar so please feel free to contact one of our experts uh, directly then we have another question from Kimberly which says in relation to the discussion of the gear tool anonymization of certain steps to avoid unconscious bias can be taken to address the issue of gender. Could you please give an example of what this could look like? Uh, yes, I, I will go into that. Um, uh, I've known some universities who, when they receive CVs uh, and application letters, they will anonymize them and then uh, uh, have a jury look at them so that the jury looking at them does not know if it's a man or a woman and like that uh, they cannot have their unconscious biases that you know an expert should be male etc etc um, influence their judgment however I have to say that it is sometimes really difficult to do this in practicalities because for example the reference letters which will be attached to a CV you know they will be referring in these reference letters to she, 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 or he, 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 and so then you really, it, it takes a lot of work to anonymize these things. This is what I know, uh, practically speaking. But in a first stage of uh, recruitment, it can be helpful to make sure that the jury is not influenced by their gender stereotypes. Um, but then obviously at a certain point, you know, you need to meet the candidate and then obviously you will most likely know the sex of that person. Uh, so it would just be at a starting stage um, that, that you would do this. Um, but there are many other possible uh, actions that you can take. For example, there is one university in Belgium that I know of who has a quota installed that on the short list of candidates you need to have um, as many men as women. And so this is really a challenge for some scientific fields, but you know these are also examples. So if you look at the gear toolbox, you will find many more examples of things that you can do to do um, to really enhance the career of women and to make sure that women are recruited, get as much chances of being recruited as men. Okay, thank you very much, Katrin. We have another question. I think this is addressed to Maxime this time in the, from Christina. In the field of research, yeah. do you consider it ethical to consider gender as one of the variables? Yeah, let me maybe uh, just reframe a little bit the, the question so that we are sure that we are on the same line. <laughs> Um, if we consider gender as a general variable, as we addressed it in the, in the, in the webinar, in the part related to uh, 
uh, the gender content in research, then not only I consider it uh, ethical to uh, address gender, as we see it is like core to many of uh, the issues covered by the calls, uh, but as unethical <laughs> not to do so, because when you, uh, you want to address reality, you have to, uh, to really uh, address all the dimensions of this reality, especially when they are so much relevant. Uh, yet, uh, technically, when you go uh, into the design of a research, uh, you might be confronted to uh, um, ethical or juridical issues in, uh, uh, depending on the way how you uh, conceive uh, gender and understood, understand it in this design. Uh, I take an example. If you uh, uh, at some point want to uh, cover issues of gender identity, uh, for instance, uh, you might be confronted uh, in certain uh, uh, contexts at the level of member states to ethical and juridical issues. So you have to check that carefully uh, uh, at the time of designing your research. But again, if we take that in general terms, then uh, uh, our argument is that addressing the gender dimension uh, not only improves the quality of research, uh, but is, uh, uh, is some sort of a necessity. Okay, thank you very much, Maxime. In case there are no further questions, I thank you all very much for your uh, participation and especially Katrin and Maxim for for the insights into the topic of gender. Uh, I just received a, ah, the feedback, Lit just sent the feedback form. So please uh, fill it out so that we can, if you have um, wishes for improvement, we can improve next time or if you liked it the way it was, we are extremely happy about this as well. Other than that, I wish you all a very nice day, a very good start into the week. And uh, in case of any further questions, please be, feel free to contact either our speakers directly or the Gender Action um, Project or Net for Society. Talk to you the next time. Bye-bye.